hope so. <laughs> okay. Um, so good morning, everyone. For me, it's morning. Uh, maybe for you, it's the evening. Uh, welcome and thanks for tuning in into my talk, Trust as the Foundation of DevOps. Um, you might expect someone like a psychologist or a PhD in sociologist, something like that, to talk about trust. Uh, actually, I'm not. I'm just an engineer. I work for a company called SAP. And um, I used to work in teams that were doing good. And I used to work in teams that were doing okay. -ish. And then I used to work in teams that are like high performing, you might say, like really good. And I was wondering, why is that? Why do we have um, such like gaps or differences in, uh, in performance between the teams? And then I started chatting with my coworkers and that, hey, we are like really doing good in this like high performing team. Why do you think that is? And we chatted and sooner or later, like everyone talked about trust. And then I seeked out other teams that were claiming like, yeah, we are doing really good. Like we are really in a flow and we're like high performing. And I asked them, why do you think that is? And sooner or later they talked, they, they used the word trust. And I went out at the company and I had the same experience, like people that claimed to work in high performing teams always sooner or later talked about trust. And then I thought there must be something like, maybe that's some kind of a secret source of high performing teams. And then I just did some investigation on like, what is trust and how can we foster it and such things. And basically the result of that, let's say private research is, is what you will see in, in this talk uh, uh, right now. So, um, yeah, let's let's start with like before we start like what is trust? Let's let's assume there is no trust, right? So completely the opposite. What what happens if there is no trust in an organization in a team whatsoever? And I would claim if you don't have trust in in a, in a team or your organization, it's like you're having the root of all that's evil in in your team, right? You will see all kind of problems popping up that you might not relate directly to to trust issues. But in fact, they are. So you get all kinds of problems for free on top of it if you just have an absence of trust or non-existence of trust in your team. Um, actually, that's that's not done by me. I said I did a lot of like studying, reading books, and, and talking to people. And um, that is one of the books. Um, it's by Patrick Lincioni. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And, and he pretty nicely pins out that um, if you investigate a lot of problems or dysfunctions, as he says, uh, in, from teams, uh, sooner or later, you, in most cases, you end up with, well, there's an absence of trust in the team, right? People that don't feel trust with others in, in their team um, avoid going into, um, into hard um, conversations or arguments even. Um, they, they are fear of the conflict because they are af afraid of that might have bad um, um, consequences for them. So they don't go into conflict. Then there are decisions made by the team that seem to be consensual, but actually some people didn't never spoke up because like, you know, they didn't feel trust and they didn't feel like um, well in, in speaking up. So they, the, the decision that is taken is not their decision, which leads to they are not committing to that to that goal or not like 100% committing to that goal. So they are completely avoid any accountability of what has been discussed or decided there because like, hey, that, that's something they decided, right? And it already starts like they and I. So they decided something, um, they will see that it'll fail, but they didn't hear me or they didn't um, go into my arguments. And um, so this avoidance of accountability and then the inattention to results. The people do have goals, but they might not um, be um, overlapping or, or um, agree, being the same goals that the, that the team has. Um, so you need to to watch out here that a lot of things that you might see in in teams that are dysfunctional uh, actually are just um, come from from an absence of trust, even though at first they they might not look like that. So trust is important, and I'm speaking about trust already since since a few minutes. So um, I think we should start with defining what trust is. And honestly, I tried to do that when preparing the talk. I was like, okay, let's, let's have a one or two sentence description of what trust is. Like, it should be easy. Like, your experience, everyone experiences trust every day in, in someone or something. And then um, I, I had really a hard time in, like, crunching this, this, this thing that I have, like, all day. I feel it. 
putting that into words is pretty hard. Then I looked up Wikipedia and then, then at sooner or later, and Wikipedia an article is, is quite fine, but, but it's pretty comprehensive. And then I came up with this very nice definition that, that I think is, is pretty good to remember um, by Dr. Tway, um, which says, trust is the state of readiness for an unguarded interaction with someone or something. And, and I liked it because it's, you can trust, you can feel trust um, to, to other people, to someone, and to some things like 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 processes or, or very abstract like virtual things, and even more, this this paper comes up with like the three elements that they think um, trust is um, constructed, and the first one is the capacity for trusting. This adds in this this like what is my experience, my past experience, like what is my history with someone or something, so something that I need to to build trust. Um, so I give you an example. If if you've never flown before, never entered an airplane, um, you might be a bit nervous. Like um, you're uncertain, like what's going on. Um, you feel high acceleration, then it goes up into the air, and things are just strange, and you don't you're not used to it. You, you don't have a history of that. But so with that, your you, your trust level might be not that high. But if you have flown a hundred times, uh, your trust level is pretty high because your history was always good with, with the system of aviation, right? So you're like, yeah, I, I'm trusting the system. So that is one element. But even if that's in place, but you are not feeling competence into the system, you might have an issue with trust again. So um, like when, I'm not sure about you, but when I enter a plane, um, I have to turn right to reach my seat. I always have a look left where the cockpit is, right? And then I'm, what if I would see the pilots there over a box of beer having a good time? I would feel, well, maybe I have flown a hundred times before and everything was fine. So basically I have trust in the system of aviation, but I'm not sure whether the people in the cockpit are currently competent to fly the plane, right? And then my trust level goes down. And the third one is like the perceptions of intention. So I have flown a hundred times. Everything was fine. Uh, I entered a plane. I look left. The pilots look like as pilots, right? Like this Tom Cruise guy is like sunglasses and like really like they are capable of handling every situation. I turn left. I, I reach my seat and I stretch my head. And then I think maybe they, they look as being competent flying a plane. But what if their intentions are not? my intentions what if they would like to do some loopings or zero g curves or whatever things that i don't want i just want to go safely from a to b so and then again my trust level would go down right so you have to have you have to come up with these three elements to to feel trust and i think with that we have a pretty good definition um, of what trust is how it could be described and how, how it's built and how it's made up um but as an engineer um and and that's what I am, um, I want to measure things, you know, that's that's still fluffy. So how could we measure things? How could we quantify that? Is that possible? And I found that you could somehow measure trust in the unit of speed, meaning um, in, in our industry, um, fast deployment fire times, fast mean time to recovery. So everything that is fast decision-making, fast execution is in teams. That goes back um, to, to trust. Command and control structures always take time and they can't come, come up with that speed that trust can do. And actually, again, there's another book um, by Stephen Covey, it's called The Speed of Trust um, that is full of examples throughout industries and, and, and situations, um, contract negotiations and whatnot um, to just um, prove that um, if you add trust in a system, things will go faster. And I think this is this is crucial for, for us talking about going into high frequent deployments, talking about continuous delivery, talking about a lot of what, what DevOps um, tr pardon me, tries to do. Because um, you need to have a, a culture that is that is that can deal with the speed technology gives us. Today we have we have deployment pipelines, we have container container platforms, a lot of things that help us accelerating things and doing things in a fast manner. But at the end, if our culture cannot come come up with that speed, we have the tools and like be ready to ship that one light of code change within seconds or minutes to the productive system. But as I had it, when I was coaching a team, we were squeezing out the minutes from the pipeline, seeing, okay, how can we do the pipeline fast? And at the end of the process, when we, had the, when, we, when we created the artifact, I said, okay, now let's deploy it. And they said, no, we can't. I said, why? 
yeah, we have to write a mail to this guy and that guy, and, and we have to wait for the confirmation. And then we measured that time, and that, in average, took 46 hours. And so like, well, why we were squeezing out minutes in the pipeline when the process lacks in speed? in speed. So we need to establish a culture of trust here so that we can leverage that speed um, and that we can deal with the with the with the speed that the tools give us. <clears throat> right? So um trust is so important in our discussion here because it it is directly bound to speed and you want to go into um faster feedback cycles with your customers most likely and for that you need to you know optimize this um uh, yeah, these processes and by using a culture of trust. So if trust is that important, if we and if we have defined trust now, I think the, the, the main question is, okay, but how can we build trust, right? And here comes the point. I have no clue. I didn't, I tell, I told you I'm a software engineer. I'm not a psychologist or anything. So I can't tell you, I can tell you how you destroy trust, but maybe that's something you already know. So <clears throat> what I can offer you is um, talk a little about how you could foster trust. And one of the, the first like elements that I think that we need to foster trust is team size. We need to have a look on team size. And team size is so important because it directly relates to communication structures. And again, this is not new. This is something that you can always also already find in, in this book coming from the from the mid 70s by Fred Brooks, The Mystical Man Months. Um, if you're into project management somehow, you should read that book or maybe buy two copies of the book and you can read it twice as, twice as fast. What the, what the book actually says, like the main line is, if you add manpower to a late software project, it makes it even later, which is like um, contradicting our natural experience, right? If you dig a hole, it takes a whole day. If you dig the hole with two people, it takes half a day. But why is that with software project that it's always like you add people and then it just goes later? Why is that? And Brooke says, well, <clears throat> it all has to do with the communication. Um, and he comes up with this intercommunication formula that basically says the more people you have in the team, the more communication lines you have, and the more the communication overhead or um, um, resources that you take to do have a good communication, it goes up by the square. So basically, if you have three persons and you have three connections with four, it's already six, and with t five, you already have 10, you see where that goes. So there is some, <clears throat> some limit, some natural limit where just communication overlaps any um, productivity improves that you get by adding people to the project because they need to com communicate more. And the question now is, okay, where is that limit? Like, what is a good size for a team? And this is where that gentleman can, could help us out. Um, Robin Dunbar, who is a psychologist who um, did some investigations and found something that became um, famous as Dunbar's number, which is a cognitive limit to the number of people with whom one can maintain stable social relationships uh, and that number is at 150 and and basically what he did he, he investigated into social structures of people teams groups organizations and always found <clears throat> that there is a like a boundary of around 150 that seems to be the, the the limit for the average person that's important here like it's always the average person but the average person that could maintain stable social relationships for example the villages of stone aged men they never had the size that they um, exceeded more than roughly 150 persons. So this village of Stone Age Man could host 150 persons. And then it seems like you can't find larger villages of Stone Age Man. Also in, in the military, the smallest tactical unit in the Roman army, the so-called money pail, had a size of 150. And so and so he had a lot of in, um, 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 proof points where he could always see it's always 150 where, where stable social structures just split up. And, and interesting for us is this, um, what Dunbar also says. He says the average, again, the average person has five intimate friends, then 15 trusted friends, 35 close friends, and 150 casual friends to have, to have stable social relationships with, right? Everything beyond that is not considered, at, according to Dunbar, not to be a stable social relationships. And he even provided a paper some years back that was with, with the social networks and everything that we have today, you can still find these numbers to be true. Interesting for our discussion here is these 50 trusted friends, right? And that already includes the five intimate friends. That leaves us to additional 10 people that we could have stable, trustful relationships to, right? 10? Hey, that's, the, that's basically the scientific proof why we always talk about teams of 10, why we talk about two pizza teams and all that. This is like the, the reason for that. This is 
the average person can maintain 10, around 10 stable, trustful relationships to other people. And if you want to have trustful relationships, then you can leverage the speed and, and have, you know, have a good uh, culture in your team. So if your team um, is not functioning that well, have a look into team size. Maybe communication that cannot go as directly or uh, as um, optimal as it should be because your team is just too large. The, the second element for me, um, how you could foster trust is diversity, right? Believe it or not, even the geekiest, nerdiest person that you know is a social uh, person, like everyone is, right? That's just our human, uh, a part of human being. Um, some people need more social um, interactions, some are less, um, but everyone needs it, right? And so never underestimate the power of an evening beer with your colleagues. So I'm German, for us it's the evening beer, for you it might be the afternoon tea or what have you, but I'm never underestimate this, this social bindings that you create with like, especially out of the office events with your colleagues um, that help um, building trust and building relationships in general um, that much. And if you see organizations like that, you know, like functional silos spread around the world, um, various time zones, this is actually quite perfect if you want to foster stereotypes and biases and never underestimate the, the, the gaps in time and space that you cre um, create or that you um, put here between people. And I know all the arguments of like, yeah, but we have all these new communication structures. And especially these days, everyone does video conferences and, and you know, all these new um, ways of communication, right? So we can solve it with that. No, because what you're talking about with these tools is communication. What I'm talking about is social interaction. And communication is a huge part of social interaction, but um, it's, not, it's not the whole um, part of, of social interaction. So again, the, the setups, organizational setups like this are perfect to foster biases and stereotypes because basically uh, any arbitrary, uh, virtually meaningless distinction between um, groups can, can separate people. And that's actually what you do with such an organization setup. And that goes back to the work of, of a gentleman called Henry Tafel. Um, Henry Tafel, um, he developed a series about social groups, like how do people feel related to groups, like formal groups, like you sign a contract, for example, with the company, then you are part of that group of the employers of that company. Or you have informal groups, like you never signed a contract, it's just a feeling, something that you basically, in your brain, you relate to be part of that group. If you cheer up for, for a soccer club, um, most likely you didn't never sign a contract with any fat cl fan club or anything. You're just like, yeah, I'm feeling related to everyone who cheers up for the same football club, right? And um, and 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 one of his studies um, revealed that, as I said, virtually meaningless um, distinction between groups, um, such as preferences for paintings or colors of shirt, can trigger a tendency to favor one own group to the expense of others. And that that experiment became, or that theory became known as the minimal group paradigm. I give you an example on, on, on what I mean. So the basic experiment, and this has been conducted over and over again with slight modifications, and um, but it always revealed the same truth. So the experiment goes like that. You have a group of random people that don't know each other, um, and you pass them red or green shirts randomly. You don't tell them that it's randomly, you just like you might flip a, a coin or something, but um, Person one gets a red shirt, red shirt, green shirt, green shirt, red shirt, whatever. It's it's random. Um, and you don't say anything further to the people. Just here, you have a red shirt, you will get a green shirt. And then you then you um, tell the people, okay, can, they can distribute the reward um, according to two methods. Method A is everyone gets 100 euros, whether they wear a green shirt or a red shirt. So the same shirt as you were on a, yeah, a red shirt or maybe a green shirt, doesn't matter. Everyone gets 100 euros. Or you say, well, everyone who has the same colored shirt as you get 60 euros, right? Uh, and the other ones that don't wear the same colored shirt as you, they only get 40 euros. And again and again, it proves that people tend to go for option B. Even that means, well, you could get 100 euros if you just distribute them evenly across everyone. People say, no, I want to have you know, my group a little favor and do them a little favor and, and give my group 60 euros, um, even if that's to the expense of my own group because we could have 100 euros, but 60 euros is fine as long as the others only have 40 euros, right? And um, this... Um, uh, this, this, this means that, that people um, 
without having a context of why they feel being part of that group and they didn't sign a contract and I said it's randomly whether they have read or green shirt and we didn't tell them what to do with the money or anything no they just want to bring their group um, in a in a better position than people in their out group so people that are not in their group and look what this could do in organizations like that right all these games of us versus them like development doesn't understand operations the ops does not understand what the business says and so on and so forth this all us versus them that's the explanation of that and that's just a trust killer so never put people that that work on the same product or service in functional silos um, as this will start this tendency of like um, rating my own group higher than than the overall goal that you're trying to achieve and that's why these um, cross-functional and autonomous teams are so successful because they bind themselves to not my role like hey i'm the ops guy or the, the dev guy no my role is like making that service making that software component what have you making that product making that good and and work great um and this is my aim and this is where i take my pride in um so so people that work on the same product should be part of the same team and in best cases from in, in the same location so that, that they can really like get this this feeling of yeah this is what where we all take pride in that we all work on and another thing is from from that is as i said it's 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 heterogeneous people like all kind of people with all kind of background from the from the business to the dev to the operations to the quality uh, uh, you know people from from the aha moment to the kaching moment the moment where you have your idea your business service whatever idea the aha moment to the kaching moment where your end user use your software all of these people in that value stream you 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 have to 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 take along to take pride in what they are doing and and that means great teams are always heterogeneous right everyone can bring to the table what what they are good in um and there isn't a uh, any successful team that isn't heterogeneous like look in sports look at uh, a soccer football team only consisting of goalkeepers wouldn't be successful look at rock and roll bands only consisting of bass players strange music interesting but not very enjoyable to listen to at least for a long time so great teams are always heterogeneous um my third and last um um advice on how you could foster um trust is safety and safety comes in in various flavors the one is like um a positive failure culture and i don't know about you but when i studied um engineering software engineering they showed me pictures like that that's a rate one system um so it's basically mirroring data between two disks why well because they they told me at the very beginning if you have hard hard hardware resources they will fail at some day your disk will fail your network card your switch whatever it will fail and you need to have like a failover right and then you need to do backups because it's like for the data it's business data it might be your family pictures you need to make sure that you be prepared that things are failing hardware resources will failing will fail and they told me all kind of methods how to deal with that right that's what i what, what i've been taught in in my studies what no one taught me in my studies is how do I deal with my very own failures, like wrong decisions that I make, actions that I do, or how do I deal with the actions uh, or the decisions that that might have been not going well from from others? So how do I deal with the with the with the failures of people? And most people think like um, success is 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 a result of avoiding failures, right? It's like that. It's often what project management tries to tell us, right? We are here, we want to go there, there's a straight line, and we already crossed out all the possible traps and failures along the way. You just need to go the straight line um, as they could pre pre um, predict the future. Um, but that's not how success works, at, le as, at least not in complex, um, in complex systems, right? In complex systems, you don't know the solution already, right? You just might have a direction where to go, but you don't have the solution. So what you do is like this iterative approach of like um, tiptoeing forward, like, okay, is that right? And then get the feedback. Okay, we are in the right direction. We go further in that direction. Oh, is that right? Oh, no. Okay, so we need to, to switch a little bit. And then basically what you do is like you, you stumble from, from one failure to the other. Um, at, and then at the later point in time, you reach something that you would call success, right? This is also important. Success and failures are always things that we judge by looking back, past, back in time and saying, 
that was a good decision or that was a bad decision. So we, we can't know upfront. And this is, I started to talk saying, I was wondering why, why do we have high performing teams and other teams that are doing like, okay. Sh and uh, that's why, why I triggered my interest in doing some research uh, in, in, in trust. Uh, Google did the same, uh, just with a bit more resources. Um, so they hired all kinds of um, 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 scientists to find out why do they have teams that are high performing and others that just do like well or okay. Um, that, that sparked in a, in a project called Aristoteles um, and that was already 2012. Uh, and what they, what they found out is that something that they called psychological safety was the most critical parameter to successful teams. What they mean is that, that that feeling of trust, that feeling of safety within a group or within an organization. Um, and in order how to, how to foster that, they came up with, well, um, you can foster um, that feeling by, by sharing weaknesses and personal vulnerabilities um, to gain psychological safety. Um, so showing empathy, and especially to leaders, saying things like, hey, I don't know, we need to decide this together. Um, can you help me here? I have a problem. I, I'm really like, I'm scared. I don't know how to do that. Um, I'm having a bad day. Such things that, that show vulnerabilities that open up the room for, for creating trust, or as they say, psychological safety. So um, I already come to my, to my wrap up slides. So think about team sizes and communications when you want to foster trust, like how big is the team? How, with how many people do you have to communicate or do you have to have a stable social uh, trustful relationship? Think about diversity. Everyone needs to be the person that they are, that they can bring their best to the table. Um, and think about psychological safety, See, talk, think about um, a failure culture, a positive failure culture. Um, think about what, what, what the Google research um, showed up with psychological safety that you can build up with showing vulnerabilities, showing that you are not all knowing that um, you need help uh, also by others. And with that, I hope I, I made it somehow in time. Mike, did I, did I, yes, you did sure I succeed? Did. Yeah, you succeeded. <laughs> okay. Definitely succeeded. So let me let me check the cues to see who if we have any questions queued up here. I don't see anything right now. Although we have we have approximately 128 people watching. So I'm not sure where the questions are or but let's give it a few minutes here and uh, we'll see before, because we're after you, we're just going on a break. So um, I'm just waiting to see if I, I already alerted in the, in the track DevSecOps uh, in Slack to, to post questions. So I'm just waiting to see if we get anything listed there. Let me see. Well, we got a question here that says, how would you advise trust for startups? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I think it, with startups, it should be actually easily, easier than in, in large multinational companies that that's simply the, the size and that's what where, where, I, where I spoke about look into the team size i mean having a hundred thousand employees like like my company you couldn't have a stable trustful relationship with everyone because it's just you can't even met everyone um, um, because it's just too huge so you have to to find out like with whom do i need a trustful stable relationships and honestly i thought but maybe that the person who raised the question could, could prove me wrong. I thought that it's much easier for, for startups that in most cases start small and then should have this trustful relationships, at least at the first entrepreneurs and then the, the first people joining. But I think um, at least that's how I got that question already a few times is like when, when these startups are successful and then they, they grew very, very fast, like exponentially, and then they add up a lot of people and then the, the, the things comes up Come, comes up with the trust because things go so fast that people um, do not take um, enough um, at, um, um, attention, do not pay enough attention on, okay, we need to think about how do we structure the whole 
um, organizational setups, like who who do we, how do we make sure that the people with the same interests can can communicate and and be connected um, in in the in the right manner. I think this is the challenge for for the most startups. As long as they are small, I think it naturally more or less works out. But then if you go like in this. Um, hopefully um, exponential growth or the, the thing takes off. This is, I think, where, where some uh, startups stumble. And I think here you really like, um, even though I know as an engineer and talking about trust, it's, it's like, this is a fluffy thing. And you know, we yeah. <laughs> don't know. And then, um, yeah, but it doesn't help. At the end, you have to take that one step back and say, okay, hey, we really have to scratch our head. Like, how do we do this? How do we align good communication structures and an organizational gotcha. setup that can ensure this? I know this at the very beginning feels odd, especially when you come up with this to your manager or boss and saying, hey, we need to do that. Um, but I think you have to. Right. So let me let me ask you this. As, as uh, it, it kind of to elaborate a little bit more on that last question, um, as as uh, processes in DevOps has uh, grown over the years, um, would that change your opinion on how you know that trust would would go for startups? I mean, because things have evolved, uh, new tools, new processes. I mean, people have tried to improve. You know, how would you explain that over the years? I, I think at least from from the time that I'm somehow involved in, in the DevOps community, like four or five years back, I think we talked a lot at the beginning, we talked a lot about tools and, and processes and configuration management tools and then containers and security and, and, and such things. And I think um, over the time we, we, we've spoken more and more about the, the, the fluffy um, um, things like like trust and how we how we could build great teams. So I think um, it has become aware of, um, yeah, now we have reached a state with our tooling and our automation that is like, as I said, we can do these um, these one-line code changes into production within minutes or even seconds, what have you. But um, there is something that we, we still don't do it. Why is that? And this is, again, we yeah, we need to talk about these, these things that, um, uh, basically, we all know them. We are all humans, but it's and we are intelligent people. But then it felt feels so hard to address them with your coworkers, with your boss, to to talk about these things. So I think these things have become in the last years more and more prominent and more and more important. And more and more people realize, yeah, without looking into that, we don't have it. And you know, applying tools is the manageable part of, of DevOps and automation. And this is like the manageable part, but the hard not to crack is like this cultural part. And I don't have, you know, the perfect plan how to, 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 do, to, to do it or how to go there. But at the end, sooner or later, you will end up with like, yeah, we have to, we have to look into that. And even though it's the not manageable part, no one can guarantee if you succeed with that because, you know, every company, every team, every organization then is, is different again. And you can look into what others do and you should do that. But at the end, you have your find your way in your company culture that mets your, yeah, your people basically. Right, right, yeah. So here's, a, here's another interesting question that came in. He says, I have a plaguing question but haven't joined a team yet. What do you do if you have foundational uh, worldview and you worry you'll you'll clash with your team based on your beliefs, even if you've worked with uh, people who are opposite than you in a close setting like DevOps? Yeah, I, I mean this. The question sounds like there isn't there isn't much trust in place, right? You know, not coming up with with this question to the team or not like coming up with that i uh, with the ideas that you have. Um, I think you can't. I mean, you it it is hard to change people' behaviors or team culture, and then first the behaviors, and then it becomes a culture. I think um, you can do it only in like baby steps. You have to go one by mm -hmm. one and um, you don't come up with like, ah, oh, I've read this book, how do Google does SRE? We just have to do it everything the same. 
And this, in most cases, will just overload people. And then they go like, and no, this is not what we need to do. And we, we did it like decades that way. And we don't want to move it all around. And with that, you, you are like hitting a hard wall. I think you need to... You need to slowly do baby steps and then like really celebrate everything that you have reached along the way. It's like really, okay, let's let's start. What I always like is starting making work visible, monitoring, like technically monitoring your system, your production systems and so on, but also making your work visible in regards to Kanban boards, whatever. What what are people actually doing? And this is like like all the something that that people can digest, right? Okay, yeah, let's do it. I'm okay now I'm Putting, pushing cards around, okay, doing that, and then you know, showing them, hey, this this has a benefit, right? Since that, since we do this and that, since we monitor the system, since we monitor what people do, we don't have this argumentations or discussions anymore. We just being a more, bit more productive, and then you know you notch them more and more into the direction you want to have them. But but be aware that this will take years, depending on you know what state. You are in and what state you want to reach that this really can can take years that is not nothing that you just you know here everyone read this book and by tomorrow we will do ex as in this book i've never seen that working so it's really it is hard work um and it always goes in baby step at least from my experience can can this be worked i guess this this trust level from the ground up or from the top down? Oh, that's that's a very good question. I think um, I have it in the basically in the same slide deck, but in the longer version of that talk at the very end, um, there is a there's a book um, um, reinventing organizations by Frederick Laloux, and I have mm -hmm. a one slide deck where I quote him where he says um, the um, the organizational um, um, how is that. Um, an organization cannot evolve beyond its leadership state of mind. So I think point. in most cases, like DevOps initiatives are driven from um, technology people from like bottom up, like, hey, there's something we do mostly because of starting with tools and we should work a little bit different in how we do that. But if the leadership is not on that state of mind that they can understand, like what problems are you trying to solve? then I think you will hit hit a roof here. So I think at least from the companies that I know that I would consider having a good DevOps journey, transformation, whatever you want to call that, it was always like coming from top down and bottom up. Most likely it started bottom up, but sooner or later, top management leadership Got you know got the notice and then um, this was all also coming from there. And so you have these two um, you have these two approaches. Um, only working bottom up, I think you will you will hit the roof, um, as Lalu says. And then if your leadership state of mind is not ready for this, put it that way, um, as then at least I haven't seen it um, um, like working out. Yeah, that's a very good point. Well, Dirk, thank you very much for taking time uh, to join us. Uh, in Thanks this conference, me. yeah, and um, we, if you want to hang out at the in the Slack channel a little bit, there might be some other questions pop we'll in do. there later. Yeah, uh, we'll but do. for right now, what we're going to do is we're going to go to a break. But before going to a break, I want to uh, make sure that everyone that is listening is aware that uh, you know to donate. You know, and you could do a quick donation by going to the Eventbrite and there's a, a just buy another ticket. There's a, an option there for you to donate uh, right below it when you registered. Um, and, you know, the, there, the, uh, the co-founder of, of Sneak was, is going to match, you know, for every dollar. So let's, you could double it up and they'll be matching, you know, every donation that comes through. And it's going to a good cause for uh, the the world, the uh, WHO, which is the World Health Organization, and other organizations also that are going to be uh, helping with the COVID uh, nineteen issues. So let's donate, you know, and this this is for all for a good cause. One hundred percent gets donated. 
So thank you, Dirk, again, and uh, we'll see you on the, in the Slack channel. Thank and you, Mike. No Take problem. Care. Take Stay care. Stay healthy, everyone. You too.